four, three, two, one. Calling the joint three o'clock hearing on the Committee on Health and Human Services and Committee on Public Safety and Intergovernmental and Military Affairs. This meeting will include the 3 p.m. joint calendar. Introduce all the, okay, basically I have Chair Wakai present, as well as Vice Chair for Public Safety, um, Brandon L. And behind me is my Vice Chair for Health and Human Services, okay. Henry Aquino. <laughs> Okay, this meeting is being streamed live on YouTube in the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business. 3 p.m. Monday, February 13th, room 225 and video conference. For those on Zoom, your audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly before it is your turn to testify. Each testify will have one minute to testify. If there's a technical glitch during your time to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. I will be reading a list of individuals who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed caption doesn't accurately transcribe the names. If you're interested in viewing the written testimony, please go to the legislator's website. You will find a link on the status page for the measure. We appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee does have your testimony that I reviewed, so I encourage you to use your time to either add additional comments or stand on your written testimony. First up, testimony for public safety. We have Tommy Johnson in support. Thank you very much. Next, we have Department of Human Services in support. Um, Kathy Betts or for Department of Human Services on Zoom. Nobody there? Okay, we're gonna move on. I see, oh, please proceed. Are you for the Department of Human Services? No. Yes. Aloha, Chair. Okay, San please Benitura. proceed. Aloha, Chair San Bonaventura, Wakai, and members. Catherine Coronaga, Department of Human Services, on behalf of Director Betts. DHS stands on its written testimony of support and defers to Public Safety Department. We appreciate everyone's support and collaboration. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I see Kat Brady here for Community Alliance on Prisons in support. And I'll be really brief. This is a really, really important bill. And one of the things that needs to be added is that the cameras need to be working because they right now 30 to 40 percent of the cameras at WCCC are not working. And in the House on this bill, what they did was they said it's for facilities, all facilities where women are housed. So they expanded it from WCCC to all facilities where women are housed. And I think the department is talking about um, cameras everywhere. It's, yeah, different bill. Oh my God, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> but what you said earlier was what the Public Safety Committee did to the women's prison with camera cameras. Good. Okay, I'm sorry. This is about the Family Visiting and Resource yes. Center, which has been the most incredible partnership between the community and the Department of Human Services. We've been working on this since 2016. It is really, really important. So thank you and sorry about that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you got me confused there. Okay, next up, we have Blueprint for Change in Support. Are you present? Um, Not present, Chair. Yoshimo, Ms. Yoshimo. Okay, next we have Hawaii Youth Services Network and Support Hawaii Children Action Network speaks and support Papa Ola Lokahi and support Hawaii Correctional System Oversight Commission, Mark Patterson and support. Mark, are you present? Okay, not present? I, hold okay, on. Ben. Chair, they were just getting admitted. Okay. Is no one else having registered to testify while we wait for Mark Patterson? Anybody else wishing to testify? There's six individuals who provided written support. Anybody else wishing to testify while we wait for Mark on our only one bill, SB 310? Okay, so Mark, you have one minute. You need to unmute. Yes. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, please proceed. Here, Hawaii uh, Correctional Systems Oversight Commission. Just want to stand on my written testimony, and I'll be back to uh, ask any questions if uh, if there are any. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, nobody else having registered, nobody else coming up to speak up. Members, any questions for Health and Human Services? Okay, public safety, no questions. Okay, we're gonna go on for decision making and we'll do a short recess while we grab somebody. Okay, thank you very much. We're calling for decision making 3 p.m. calendar joint for health and human services and public safety. Um, chair's recommendation is to pass as is comments, questions, and concerns for our health and human services committee. Seeing none, vice chair for the vote, chair votes aye. Okay, Senate Bill 310, recommendation is to pass as is. Chair votes aye. Vice chair votes aye. Senator Mariwaki, no. excuse. Senator Shane Curl. Aye. Sarah Alba, it's excused. Recognition is adopted. For public safety, we have a 305 agenda and we will make decisions on this bill at the end of our 305 agenda. Okay, thank you very much. So we are adjourned for the three o'clock calendar. Thank you folks very much. Oh. Uh, thank you for joining us for our 305 Public Safety Intergovernmental Affairs, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs hearing on this February 10th in room 225. Um, we have a number of measures on this agenda, starting with Senate Bill 151 relating to law enforcement reform. First on our testifiers list, we have Adrian Gakwa from the Attorney General's office? Not present, Chair. Oh, sorry, he's, he's in person. I'm here. Good afternoon, Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Elefante, Deputy Attorney General Adrian Dakwa on behalf of the Department. Uh, as noted in our testimony, we just have two comments. Uh, one, with regards to the language on page five, uh, regarding the introduction of the policies on training that second sentence that starts on line four, the policies and training may be considered as a factor in the totality of circumstances in determining whether the officer acted reasonably, but shall not suggest striking that second language in its entirety. There's already a framework uh, with the rules of evidence to allow for the introduction of writing up incidents of the use of force as opposed to the excessive use of force. We're not sure whether the omission of excessive or unnecessary was intentional or not, but it seems quite voluminous to have an officer write up every incident of use of force as opposed to just excessive force where we want to focus on. So those are the only two comments we have. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to ask any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kapwak. Manuel Hernandez from the police department has submitted commentary. Oh, I'm sorry, he's joining us via Zoom. Hi, Captain Hernandez. Good afternoon, I'm sorry. Good afternoon Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Lefante, uh, committee members. Um, Captain Manuel Hernandez with Training Division of the Honolulu Police Department. Um, the HPD supports the intent of Bill of Senate Bill 151, and uh, we'd like to provide the following comments and recommendations for your consideration. Um, we support Section 139, Law Enforcement Use of Force Policies. Um, we currently have in place policies and procedures that either meet or exceed those proposed in the bill. Uh, this includes reasonableness in the use of force, a duty to intervene with regard to unlawful use of force, and use of force training and reporting. Um, however, we have some concerns regarding the language under Section 139, uh, reports of use of force by law enforcement officer. Our first concern would be that having an officer submit a written notification upon observation of another officer utilizing force may cause an undue delay uh, in determining whether or not the force used was proper and or justified, um, you know, based on what the observing officer perceives as the use of force. For example, um, use of force could be perceived as such a minimal action like routine handcuffing, um, you know, making determination subjective. Yeah, we feel that if the concern is that the use of force utilized by a law enforcement officer is unreasonable or excessive, uh, the bill's language should be updated as such to provide the clarification. Uh, our second concern is the 15-day timeline contained in the bill um, regarding the complete uh, completion of an investigation that is submitted to, uh, by a department head to be uh, submitted. 
administrative investigations to any use of force may be complex, and this timeline may not be feasible for a thorough investigation to be completed. We currently also have policies and procedures in place to properly investigate such incidences to ensure the appropriate corrective action is administered in the event that inappropriate or unreasonable use of force was utilized. As the bill progresses forward, discussions can be had at the time by our leadership as to what would be considered a sufficient and reasonable time period for the investigation to be completed and submitted, including the information that would be available based on the time frame in the bill as it's currently written, which we can propose at the next hearing. In summary, the HPD, we appreciate the committee's consideration of our comments regarding Senate Bill 151, and I'll be available for questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Captain Hernandez. That's all I have for those indicating that they want to testify on this measure. Is there anyone else in the room or online that would like to comment on Senate Bill 151? If not, any questions? Yes, Senator Elefante. Question for HPD. Captain Hernandez? No, I'm standing by, sir. Hi, Officer Hernandez. Currently now, does HPD have a policy on use of force? Yes, sir. We have a use of force, and it's also available for public view on our official website, honolulupd.org. We have our use of force policy. Yes, sir. And as a follow-up to that, my final question is, do you know when that was last updated? I don't have the information available right now, but I could check and get back to you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, Captain Hernandez. I want to say, sorry, it's rather recently, as testifying in a previous Senate bill, you know, our policy procedures are updated regarding chokeholds, you know, the banning of, except in a deadly force situation. So that's a few years recent, but I can get back to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Captain Hernandez, I have a couple questions for you. I mean, looking through the part where they're talking about the required training, and it goes through 19 requirements on how to train a police officer in response to any kind of criminal activity. And I've never seen in statute where we put in specific training guidelines for whoever, like a social worker, a police officer, construction, or what have you. Is this a good precedent for us to, in statute, say what should be the training criteria for government employees? You know, police officers are kind of under a different set of training, sir. You know, we, you know, there's a lot of constitutional law involved, state law, federal law. That would, for opinion-wise, you know, I would want to provide an opinion based on the department in response to that. But for myself, you know, with our, I'm currently the captain of our training division and our recruits over, you know, they go over thousands of hours of training throughout their, I guess, academic career here prior to going out to patrol and other assignments. So the thing about use of force is it's always, best practices are always preferred. And we're always reviewing our use of force policies to ensure that not only are we submitting the best practices and accepted procedures, you know, it's just my opinion. If it's codified in legislative, you know, verbiage, it may take a little time to update it, you know, for based on the legislative sessions where it may be faster for us to implement newer, better, best practices as they develop. Such an effect of, you know, my recent commentary regarding our use of force and the banning of chokeholds. So I can definitely get an official police stance on that to you, sir. But for my opinion, it's, it may, you know, codifying it in the legislature like that may hinder the opportunity to update it to the best practices as soon as possible. Right. I mean, there might be new law enforcement tools that come up and you wouldn't be able to utilize that tool because it's not in this training manual, so to speak, in statute. So is that it provides us liability, right? If we are clearly delineate in the law how a conduct is supposed to be done. And let's say there's a new tool, new jujitsu move or whatever that is out there and it's not in law, that's going to expose HPD or any county police department to liability that, oh, you didn't have a procedure to train because it's not in statute and it shouldn't have been used. And then it just opens up the county for liability, correct? 
Correct, sir. If it's a codified in black and white law, uh, we must abide by it. That is to include on the double-edged sword side, just like you said, sir. Um, we can't use any new or better technique that may be less impactful or more um, conscious in, and benefit the community more um, prior to it being signed into law. Correct, sir. Members, any further questions? If not, thank you very much, uh, Captain Hernandez. Thank you. Move on to Senate Bill 685. We have uh, Todd Yukutaki from the. Hi, Todd. Please join us. Todd President. So oh, to President. oh, no, Todd, Todd's here in person. Yep, thank person. you. Yeah. Aloha Committee, uh, Todd Ibutake, uh, represent the Hawaii Farms Coalition, and we provide comments for SB 685. Um, we agree with the intent of this bill. Uh, we agree that uh, people can use guns to threaten others uh, unless in self-defense. However, we believe that the current law of terroristic threatening already covers the intent of this bill. Uh, if you still intend to uh, move forward with this bill, um, we want assurances that legal gun owners won't be charged uh, with brandishing for accidents or um, let's say, for example, there's a car crash, you're talking to the uh, other driver, uh, wind blows or something happens where your shirt rides up and your gun is exposed and they feel threatened by that. We want to make sure that accidents like that um, aren't um, covered by this. Uh, so I recommend taking out the word phrase uh, or in reckless disregard of the risk of terrorizing and just make this an uh, intent only bill. Uh, second thing uh, we can change is we want clear protections if a firearm is displayed in self-defense. Uh, it doesn't appear to be covered by use of force policies currently. So I attached the uh, Arizona law to this um, justification defensive display of firearm. So if uh, you feel threatened and you show your firearm to the um, attacker, to the threat, then you can't be charged with uh, brandishing. So uh, please review that and um, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. Marcus Tanaka. Hello. Um, I would like to add to my testimony that, um, sorry, camera's a little, that, you know, like other forms of use of self-defense. It also states that the person, you know, isn't the initial aggressor. You know, I would like to see you guys add this, that, you know, brandishing a firearm, you know, with the current wording, but they also have to be the initial aggressor, which they're the one that started the problem, started the argument, started the fight, things like that. Um, that way, like um, Todd mentioned, you know, if you're using it for self-defense, you're not the typically not the initial aggressor. If someone's coming at you, someone's pushing you, someone's shoving you. Yeah, and um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. Michael Rice. Oh, well, I'm not uh, yes, Michael Rice. Um, I wrote in opposition against this bill, although honestly, I'm kind of on the fence about it. Like Todd said, I I have concerns that this my law might be misused if for accidental printing or. You know, like I said, if I'm if I go shopping and you know some, somebody, oh, can you get that off the top, Jeffrey? Oh yeah, sure. And then you know they see that and they start screaming bloody murder. You know, because I mean we, I've seen countless people in you know writing letters to the editor or you know just on Facebook commenting saying that oh, oh if I see somebody with a gun I'm gonna scream bloody murder. And, you know, with, you know, so would they catch the brandishing charge if, like I said, I accidentally sh show my gun? What about another instance, like if potential road rage, if I'm riding with somebody and they have a road rage incident and, you know, I'm not, I'm just a passenger, I'm trying to stay out of it or de-escalate. And then, you know, my, my friend says, hey, you better watch your mouth. My friend get one gun, he's going to shoot you. Who, who catches the charge in that case? Because I was trying to stay out of it. Um, and like I said, I, I worry that, you know, this could escalate because we had an incident at Kaiser where a man was carrying a taser on his person in the parking lot. Somebody reported it to security and they went on lockdown and then 
you know, within an hour on social media, people are saying, oh, there's a man with a machine gun shooting up Kaiser, killing all the patients, and basically just causing havoc. What, you know, the, would that man get the brandishing charge, even though it just kind of happened? He didn't mean for it to do. And uh, other than that, I sign on the rest of my testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rice. That is all I, I'm sorry, we have um, Ryan Tenahero. Is Ryan has indicated they would be here in person. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on? Yes, Mr. Lee, right? Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Um, I oppose this bill because I think it poses potential uh, threats to people who may be deemed to be branching. About five months ago, I lived on the windward side on a perimeter lot. There's mountains and trails behind my house. About five years, uh, five months ago, I was outside my house. My wife was behind a building my, on my property. And she, I heard noise like a air gun, like a, not an air gun, a, a nail gun. She came running to me and said, somebody's shooting at me. And I thought, I, I heard something, but I didn't know what it was. She said, go get my keys and my phone. It's there. I don't want them to get it. So I went and got it. I walked around a building, looking at the mountain, you know, the trail, didn't see anybody. I came back in, I was about to enter the building and I heard that shot again and a window broke. I went outside the building to hide behind the building. I called 911, they're sending police. They told me to go meet them. I looked at the building, another shot. My wife ran into our house, which is a separate building. She, she heard more noises in the building Somebody shot off a glass door and a glass window, thousands of dollars. And I would want, and it was maybe a, a mentally ill person. It's crazy because we heard yelling, incoherent yelling, but this is a random uh, event. I would have loved to be able to maybe deter them by pretending I have a gun uh, just so that maybe they would go away to de-escalate. I don't want to get into any fights with anybody, but I don't want them to think that they can come onto my property and shoot up my house and shoot at my wife without any fear. So I oppose this bill. Thank you, and I'm, I'm available for any questions if you want. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to comment? Uh, Mr. Oh, we're going to go with uh, Major uh, Trinidad, correct? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. Um, again, I'm Major Joseph Trinidad, Honolulu Police Department. I have the records and ID division under which um, firearm section is under my responsibility. The Honolulu Police Department supports the intent of Senate Bill 685 relating to firearms and submits the following comments and recommendations for your consideration. This bill establishes a misdemeanor offense of brandishing a firearm. The violations described in this bill are already established in Hawaii Vice Statute 707-716, Turkic Threatening in the First Degree, which is a Class C felony. The Hong Police Department has concerns that the bill would com provide confusion with enforcement and prosecution. The Hong Police Department has introduced House Bill 119 with companion bill, Senate Bill 234 relating to firearms. These bills specifically address improper concealment regarding a person who is licensed to carry a concealed firearm. The Hong Police Department appreciates the committee's consideration of our comments regarding Senate Bill 685 relating to firearms and thanks you for the opportunity to testify. And again, I'm available for any questions, sir. Thank you, Mr. Trinidad. This gentleman here. Avenue Chair, Senators, Committee. I'm Jerry Ewan. I'm president of the Pool Law Rifle and Pistol Club. Uh, I oppose this bill. Just piggybacking off uh, all my other friends who oppose it mostly because of the ambiguous language where specifically it says, indicates by word or conduct that the person is carrying a firearm. Uh, that can be misconstrued. Anybody with a baggy Aloha shirt with carrying a cell phone pager on their belt, looks like they're carrying a firearm. Uh, a lot of people just have that gunfighter kind of look, including every policeman. One of the ways to stop crime is to put fear into the criminal to not commit that crime. So in fact, it is actually terrorizing 
people not to be bad. So, um, so to your questions. Oh, we're going to take questions at the end. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 685? Yes. Hello, my name is Brian Tinahiro, and I signed on my written testimony in opposition to SB 685. The reason being is because it's highly ambiguous, and there aren't really other measures that can be focused on. This one essentially creates an artificial brandishing uh, misdemeanor charge, and the other concern I had is that when it comes to public safety, and as probably already elaborated in earlier testimony, there are other mechanisms, other crimes already going on, home invasions in Milani, assaults in parking lots, things of that nature. So when it comes to public safety, there are, there's other ways of protecting the public aside from creating artificial misdemeanors. Thank you for your time and I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you, Ryan. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Members, any questions? Uh, Major Trinidad? Uh, did I hear you correctly saying yes, that sir. everything that's embodied in this bill is already covered in the, the, terror, was it the terroristic threat? Yes, sir, in the first degree, yes, sir. Okay, and under the current law, brandishing a firearm is a felony. Brand? Uh, the, the terroristic threat? If mm -hmm. I were to show uh, a gun that and were convicted of brandishing a weapon, that's considered a felony. Okay. Um, I, can, I have the, I have this, I have it right with me right now, sir. I can read it off. Oh, you just tell me, is it a felony or is it a misdemeanor? It's, it's a felony. When you when say brandishing, actually brandishing is not even, yeah, yeah it's not even, terrorist threatening. yes, it's more terroristic threatening. You're using, you know, when you say brandishing, sir, that, that's, I don't even think, you know, I can stand corrected. That's not even the HRS as of right now, not brandishing. Okay. But yes, sir. But to, so to hold up a gun yes, sir. would, and if I did so currently, that would be considered terrorist yes, threat. Yes, sir. And the, the penalties would be stiffer than what this bill purports that if you brandish a weapon, uh, that's a misdemeanor. So in fact, the current law is actually more stringent than- It's class C films right now, right. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Again, we, we actually introduced the bill, hasn't been um, introduced yet. In fact, exactly what we're talking about, I have it right here, but it hasn't been introduced yet, sir. The that's actually called neg uh, negligent concealment of a firearm by licensee. There's something one of the testifiers earlier, I think it was Marcus Tanaka, said that, uh, that sometimes if there's there's something chaotic or uh, threatening going on, that that pulling out a gun actually might de-escalate some. You know, people are acting up. Well, stop acting up. Um, and, but under the current law, if that were to be happening, um, the individual would be charged with terroristic threat, even if their intention was just to de-escalate this violent episode going on in front of you. So you're looking for a textbook answer? I would say so, but uh, like I said, I think two days ago, um, situation, situational dependent. But yeah, there is a, um, they can be charged with that as, ours, as far as it, um, sticking with the prosecutors, that's a different case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything we see, yeah, so you're looking for a textbook answer, there is no textbook answer. We look at everything situational dependent. Yes, sir. Thank you. Major Trinidad, I noticed sir. you also had a package, um, which was SB 234. Yes, sir. Um, that's the bill that you're referring to, right? Yeah, this, um, yeah. But that's not on the agenda here today. Yes, sir. But um, in that measure, um, it talks about, um, which is related to what we're talking about here, uh, neg negligent concealment of a firearm by a license. Licensee, yes Licensee. sir. Licensee, so what would, what would that look like? If they were negligent, if they were negligent in the concealment of a firearm, I can, how, would, how would you enforce that? Okay, I can read it off right now, sir. Sure. Again, um, HB 119 and SB 234, they're companion bills, basically, okay. yes. So, as it reads right now, again, it hasn't been introduced yet, on um, negligent consumer of a firearm by licensee, A, a person commits the offense of negligent consumer of a firearm by licensee if the person holds a valid concealed carry firearm license and without legal justification displays or fails to completely conceal the license of firearm even briefly 
causing alarm to any other person, or fails to secure the firearm on their person by dropping it in open view of any other person or by leaving the firearm in a public place. Negligent concealment of a firearm by a licensee is a petty misdemeanor. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, Major. Thank you, Chair. Good question. Yes, sir. sir. Oh, um, I get, but there are states, I guess Arizona was alluded to earlier, that do have brandishing a firearm as a, you know, as an offense on their books too. So if the committee were to move this forward, do you think we should probably, to make brandishing a firearm a separate offense in the HRS, that we should probably comport to Arizona, because since it appears, given the opponents of the measure, that it addresses a lot of the concerns that they brought up today. Sir, um, in the interest of public safety, we can take that into consideration. I can't give you an answer, a hard textbook answer at this time. I can get back to you on that one, sir. But we're willing to, like I said um, two days ago, we're willing to work with you folks to come up with a reasonable product that, that would be enforceable. Okay, but at this point right now, negligent consumption of a licensed firearm is what the direction you're working towards. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Which is again, which again is a pity misdemeanor. Yeah. Yes, sir. And Major Trinidad, sure. I don't know if I got your written testimony, so if you could please okay. give it. We have it. Oh, yeah. you have it. Sorry. Yes, sir. My problem is I don't have it in my book. Yes, sir. Printed testimony. Thank you, Major. Yes, sir. Um, again, is there anyone else wishing to testify on 685? Okay. We're going to move on to the next measure on our agenda. That is Senate Bill 882 relating to firearms. On our testifiers list, we have Marcus Tanaka via Zoom. Oh, hello. Um, I just wanted to, geez, I need a new, sorry, I need a new computer, but, um, you know, the, to expand the classroom to 14 hours plus the two hour shooting qualification just to purchase a handgun, that's going to be a three day class because you're going to do one day, seven hours, and then the next day, seven hours. And then the third day would be shooting, the shooting portion. So most instructors for any kind of firearm training charge about $250 for a five to seven hour class. Average for about five to six hours, you know. Um, so now you're talking about two days, that makes it to $500 class. Now, what about the third day? That's maybe another $100 of the instructor's time. So we're looking at minimum, not even including ammo, you know, $600 out of the student's pocket. So that's the first portion of the bills that, that I don't agree with. And then the second portion regarding the interviews for a concealed carry weapons holder, you know, the Supreme Court said that any requirements has to be objective and not subjective. So with that being said, what is their interviewer going to ask that already isn't being asked on the current forms? You know, because anything they ask, like, how are you feeling today? Or, you know, things like that would be up to the interviewer. And then does HPD have the staff to interview, you know, 600 applications without causing an excessive delay? You know, they're gonna have to interview probably 10 people a day minimum, and that's gonna still cause a one year delay. Yeah. And then um, I think the other part of the bill was um, asking for references, character references. Um, Again, this is redundant and doesn't need to be done. What kind of person is going to submit a bad reference? And it can't be family members or things like that. So, you know, I know some old people who are gun owners and their friends all die, their fellow, because they're old, you know, so they don't have much friends. So I'm friends with them now and I'm, you know, in my 30s and I haven't known them for three years. I just met them because I'm like, hey, well, you know, why are you, you know, how come you don't hang out with your friends? Oh, they're all dead. So how's that person supposed to get four references for a concealed carry license. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. Deb Neiman from Brady, Hawaii, has uh, indicated she would be here. Um, Jerry Ewan. Oh, Mr. Ewan. Good afternoon, I'm back in. Uh, standing on my testimony, and I feel that this bill is uh, far overreach and violates the fourth and fifth amendments. Uh, trying to give up the three years worth of social media, um, interviewing in person with HPD, uh, giving references, uh, 
giving information about everybody in your household, every adult in your household. To me, that's too much of a far overreach, and I'm sure HP would probably agree that they don't have the manpower to do this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Andrew Namiki Roberts from Hawaii Firearms Coalition. Uh, IT, are Not they- Not present. Not present. Oh, thank you. Michael Rice via Zoom. One moment. All right, I stand in opposition to this bill. Um, okay, the, like the, th the three years access to your social media accounts. On one social media site, at shortly after the start of the Ukraine war, I gave detailed information on how to sabotage railway lines without explosive or heavy equipment, as well as when shown a picture of an armored railway, uh, look, an armored train used by the Russians, where are the best places to be to strike that with something like an RPG in order to disable it? I mean, under this so-called good, uh, good moral character, would that be, you know, was that good moral character? I'm helping people defend themselves against the aggressor, or what if whoever is designated to review my case sees that and is pro-Russian and says, oh, no, denied. And plus two, I mean, all my social media accounts, I can't, tell you how many social media accounts I have. Everything from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Fur Affinity, DeviantArt, FetLife. You know, I, there's a bunch more I'd like to say that'd be rather embarrassing for me. But I mean, I, am I gonna have to make some poor HVD officer comb through all those posts that I made? And how many officers are gonna devote to this? Because from what I've heard, HPD only has one officer right now working on all the concealed carry licenses and he's threatening to quit because he's being overworked and not getting any assistance. Um, let's see what else I want to say. And like, as the other said, what about character references? I, all my friends are gun owners. There's, oh yeah, sure, Mike's cool. And I only know them from the range. You know, I, if, especially if I can't use my brother or my mom or anybody else. And, you know, uh, and I would also mention the cost. I estimated just to, sh just to buy ammo for the two hour shooting course would cost at least $600. And that's if you're buying the cheapest ammo you can buy online. That's not including shipping and handling, as well as a hazmat fee. Local stores are gonna, the prices are gonna be a little bit more and that's for nine mil. If you have something much more expensive like 40 caliber or 45 cal, that's going to raise the price up even more. And again, this is just for the ammo. Never Thank mind you, that Rose. you're, all right. I've sent the rest of my testimony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Adrian Flack. Indicated the President Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Jason Wolford, also on Zoom, I believe. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Jason Wolford. I'm a firearms instructor here in Maui. I've been teaching for a little over 10 years. I'm certified through multiple agencies for firearm training. Since this bill limits classes to only Hunter's Ed online or basic NRA basic pistol class, the NRA basic pistol class does not cover this added material that is in this bill. It is against NRA policy to add materials to your classes that they do not cover in the class that they have created. So instructors would be teaching outside of the scope of the class and risk losing their teaching credentials. The NRA instructor would also have to be a certified to teach concealed carry weapons where the, this material is covered. Not all NRA instructors have this training. Other agencies do allow instructors to cover this material in their basic pistol class. I think if this bill were to move forward, it would be good to say, certified firearms instructors and not just limit to strictly NRA instructors, since this will greatly limit people's options of instructors. As stated before, the additional time of four hours classroom to 14 hours of classroom and two hours of range time will make this one day basic handgun safety class a two to three day class and more than double the cost. As stated before, classes are running around $200. This will most likely take the cost anywhere from $400 to $800 or more, pricing many people out of their Second Amendment right, which is not allowed under the Bruin for the undue burden that it would place on people. The Maui Police Department 
currently the firearms division is open only open four days a week requiring interviews will add even more time just to receive a basic permit to acquire much less the four months it currently takes to get a concealed carry license here in the county of maui i believe that's all my time uh i will be available for any questions on my testimony thank you for your time thank you thank you mr wolfer ryan tinajero senators thank you for your time i once again stand on my written testimony in opposition to is is the 882 in particular as i've already elaborated earlier my concern with it it ties to the fact that it essentially charges for a right you by extending the timeline and also the content material that needs to be gone over in classes people need to essentially pay more and then as the previous testifier specified this would also be at increased cost instructor who would have to learn probably take more classes and then pass that on to the students that would be essentially problematic as far as when as far as it comes to ex the exercise of a right moreover there's a very sub subjective aspect of good moral character it's it was already mentioned earlier but here in the bill it's not explicitly defined so really good moral character can be really whatever the interviewer wants it to be and because of that aspect there is no real objective basis to really conduct these interviews and essentially denials get results just on one individual's perspective of good moral character. For these reasons, I advise that you guys, that you all vote, vote no and I'll be available for any questions or comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Stephen Lee. Good afternoon again. I stand on my written testimony. I'd like to point out that yeah, I've been a shooter in a sports, uh, involved in the shooting sports for 49 plus years, almost 50 years now. Um, I object to the expense of taxing me on my right to exercise my, my constitutional rights to shoot guns. To, to charge me after 50 years, basically 50 years of experience, to train me how to shoot my guns. I have many guns, I train other people. I think it's, it's excessive and it's unreasonable on this and many other points as uh, stated in my testimony and the others who testified before me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. We have uh, Todd Ipitake. Aloha committee, uh, Todd Ipitake. Um, I'm a, I oppose, sorry, uh, I oppose and suggest a change to SB 882. Uh, I'm a master firearms instructor and the NRA uh, training counselor liaison for Hawaii. So I train and mentor the instructors here. Um, <clears throat> as far as the training requirements, um, our current system of training, the four hours plus two hours of live fire is sufficient for what is needed to own a gun. Remember that this is just a basic class. It's not a self-defense class. Uh, even for the instructors too, they are basic for, well, most farm instructors in Hawaii are basic firearms instructors. What you do is teach uh, operation of a gun, um, the three safety rules to prevent accidents, um, the laws, uh, maintenance, storage, things like that. Uh, a lot of the things on this 14-hour uh, list are things uh, they're not trained to teach, basically. Um, also, some people don't need uh, self-defense training. Some people collect guns for uh, collections, like, uh, you know, old World War II guns, uh, hunters. Some people hunt with guns and that's it. So just be aware of that. They can seek additional training like for CCW or uh, other things after their basic class. So just keep that in mind. Uh, like others said, $16 would be difficult. It would more than double the price of the class, uh, which would be difficult, plus the time requirements. Um, also this, let me see. I am against the requ extra requirements as far as references, social media accounts, um, things like that. Uh, the invasion of privacy are not necessary. Just go off convictions um, as we do now. As far as my recommended change, uh, subjects like suicide prevention, situational awareness, de-escalation, they're important for farm owners to know, but not just farm owners, it's, it's everyone in the public. Children have a high rate of suicide. Um, public in general, you know, crime prevention too. So what I recommend is the state get all their experts together, psychologists, social, um, social, uh, 
uh, sociologists, social workers, they come together and make a video, put it on the internet for the public to see, make a, you know, advertise it out. And for farm owners, if you want them to see it, um, they can watch the video online and print out a certificate, give that to the police as proof that they went through the training. That would be uh, convenient for farm owners, uh, won't cost us anything, and um, would benefit the public in general too. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 882? Oh, yes. Major Trinidad. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Sir. Again, um, Joseph Trinidad, Major uh, Hong Police Department, again, Records and ID Division. I have, I am again responsible for the firearms section. The Hong Police Department supports the intent of Senate Bill 882 relating to firearms to increase the no requirements for training. Additional training instruction would provide applicants more knowledge and information about the safe handling and use of a firearm. However, we have the following concerns with other portions of this bill and submit the following comments. The requirements for in-person interviews would cause significant delays in the application process. Currently, the applicant provides and declares to all required information that is used to conduct a thorough background check by completing an application and all the required forms. An in-person interview would not provide any specific or clear indicia whether or not a person is suitable to carry a firearm in public. Another concerns the requirements for the applicant to provide the names contact information for all family members residing in their home, as well as for references and their former and current social media accounts for the past three years. This information would not be objective, nor would it be a clear indication that the applicant is suitable to carry a firearm. Lastly, this bill proposes that the standard for an applicant for a concealed carry license is of good moral character, which conflicts with Supreme Court ruling in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. The Supreme Court found that the standard for applicants seeking a concealed carry license to be a suitable person. Former Attorney General Holly Shakira opinion dated on July 7th, 2022, reiterated that an applicant for a concealed carry license should be of suitable person standard. The Home Police Department appreciates the committee's consideration of our concerns regarding Senate Bill 882 relating to firearms and thanks you for the opportunity to testify. Again, I'm available for any questions, sir. You might want to stay there. Any questions? No problem, sorry. Yes, sir. I have a few questions. So you just mentioned about the delay in application. Yes, sir. Across. Help me understand, like if I were to try to get a firearm today, what would, how much time would that take? And under this, this particular scenario, yes, how much time do you think it would take? Right now, presently, it's about the three, three four weeks. That's for once um, we were told you got to make it happen. It was all hands on deck. And um, some of the testifiers already said, we're as shorthanded as it is, but we're doing whatever we can to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So to add the, the in-person interview, that would that would be another drain on our resources. We'd have to probably bring extra people in, what have you. Yeah. And even setting up an interview, right? Exactly. Like, okay, what day of the week at this time? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And then you mentioned that the... You, you believe that social media inquiries is not going to be really insightful into uh, the mindset or the character of a person? Yes, sir. Basically, again, um, again, uh, past um, testimonies already said it. Who's going to have to go to that? For us, I can, again, I can only speak for the Honolulu Police Department. We do have to do it for, for the um, for City County of Honolulu. Again, that's another drain of resources that, we, well, not, I'm going to say drain, but we have to a lot additional resources to even conduct that going to their social media accounts like oh okay i look at this bill yes, and sir. i look at hawaii we have the lowest amount of gun violence out of the lowest or one of the lowest uh gun violence in, in america and i just see that this is a bill that's addressing a problem that really doesn't exist um just arbitrarily going from five hours or four hours to 14 hours I mean, I think if we were in Detroit, maybe this is something that we should be looking at. But considering how few gun violence incidents that we have here, is it really necessary for us to put the burden in terms of uh, hours in, in uh, lessons, dollars spent, putting the burden on you to do all of this background stuff to achieve what? I mean, it's, it, it, we've already got very little gun violence in the state. 
So, uh, Chair, this big thing, you answered your own question, sir. <laughs> um, basic for the training wise, I'll be honest with you, um, me person from my military background and from my over 30 years in the home police department, additional training is always good. To me, you can never train too much. If you additional training, so, and I have, we have a saying in the army, um, it's better to um, sweat in training than bleed in battle. So additional training, oh yes. We're for it, you support the intent. As far as the other portions of the bill, we have, we have concerns and that's what we brought up. I mean, this, where does it end, right? It's, we're going from four to 14. I mean, if we go to 50 hours of training, are we gonna make sure that like, there's no gun violence in this town? I mean, you're still gonna get the radical individual, right? We're really not, it's, to me, we're trying to create a solution for a problem that is so tiny. Sir. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Vice, vice. Yeah, um, being familiar from the county side, Major Trinidad, is HPD going through the budget process now at the county looking at additional positions to process permits for firearms? Well, um, Chair, that's that's the whole department. <laughs> In fact, that's all the city, city departments. We're all running short. Yes, we're doing what we can to bring additional people in to actually allow for next for next year's budget or and beyond. Because okay. we already know because, yeah, this is since, again, I brought it up before, this is my... I'm over 30 years in. I never thought we would see this, and it it came with a flurry. Yeah. You know, we, we're making we work, we're doing whatever we can do to make it happen. Believe me, we are trying our best. And lastly, as um, a comment, Chair, um, sure. just appreciate you know your years of service in law enforcement. Yes, so thank you so much, Major. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Real quick, can I chair? Yeah, of a yes, sir. Here. yes, sir. No, I mean, I first of all, just thank you for your service, and actually, thank you for your all your testimony and all these various bills. You've been an incredible resource and in trying to guide the committee. I think and coming up with good sound legislation on this uh, important issue. But yes, sir. I agree with your point, you know, there can be no such thing as too much training. However, as many of the first people have uh, testified, you know, the cost of training, the more training you receive, the more expensive it is, and then it becomes probative. So I'm just throwing this out there, yes, you know, not that it'll be considered in the bill or anything, but do you think in order to encourage more training, we should possibly look at some kind of a rebate or something so that Basically, the more you train, the less expensive it is. So you would get 14 to 20 hours, but the cost of such because of this financial assistance would equal what would be normally four or five hours. So now you have an incentive to go and get all this extra training and practice and interaction with instructors, which kind of builds a personal relationship to the instructors. It's a great, a great comment, sir. And in regards to that, for I, as a home police department, we say, yeah, we're for that. But the thing is, it doesn't directly affect us because we verify the instructors we're not the ones that's incurring we're not the ones that's charging we're just verifying instructors and verifying their lesson plan and everything as far as what you're talking about the rebaser that would be for the um for the gun owner and i guess for the instructor yes sir that to me that, that sounds pretty good but again it doesn't directly affect us sir, no, because no, we, right. don't, we don't do the training sir yes sir thank you chair for the that. sure good questions any further questions okay thanks sir thank you uh, the last bill on this agenda is Senate Bill 1447 relating to tobacco products. On our testifiers list, we have the Department of Health first. Any representative from the Department of Health? Good afternoon, Senator Bakai and um, Vice Chair Elefante and Member McKelvey. I'm Lola Irvin, representing Dr. Kenneth Fink for the Department of Health. And the Department of Health is in strong support of SB 1447. Um, it is written in a way, and um, we had to read it a few times, um, but um, I think um, the uh, purpose is to provide the counties um, the authority to regulate the sale of tobacco products. And um, we do provide public health data. And this data that we collect and we provide is based on the request from the counties. And so um, I do appreciate that we do have um, Vice Chair Alafonte here who served on the council. And I know that all of you know your communities really well. And I appreciate that very much because as you'll note, um, smoking and e-cigarette use varies by geographic areas. And especially where um, we have had principals, we've had um, mayors, we've had county members, um, we've had neighborhood boards ask us to please take action. Unfortunately, since 2018, 
um, the counties have not been able to pass any stricter regulations than the state has. And the state has not passed any regulations for e-cigarette use especially. And so where we have a 31% overall e-cigarette use by high school students, by neighbor islands, it is 35 to 36%. And so um, the neighbor islands, they know, and the counties, and you know, what is happening in your communities and neighborhoods. Unfortunately, uh, what happened in 328J 11.5 does not allow our counties to take action. So we do strongly support this, knowing that equity means that we do allow then the communities to act on what they know. And um, from a public health perspective, I think we all agree that we want our KPs to grow strong and to be healthy. So thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the state Hawaii State Association of Counties. Anyone on Zoom representing them? Not present, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Don Wiseman, American Heart Association. Has, is, yes. Mr. Wiseman, it's on Zoom. Aloha. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'm Don Wiseman, representing the American Heart Association, Hawaii affiliate. Uh, American Heart Association supports SB 1447 as well. I um, want to point out that the amendment to the bill that was passed in 2018 that that created preemption of the counties was uh, was passed without ever having a public hearing. It was a last minute addition back when that was still allowable to another bill totally unrelated and the public never had an opportunity to, to testify on that that added measure. Uh, most of Hawaii's most effective tobacco related laws have uh, contributed to reductions in youth and adult smoking. They began as, uh, as ordinances passed by Hawaii's counties. And some of those aimed, uh, those ordinances aimed at addressing pu uh, local public health threats, proved their effectiveness at the county level before they were replicated in state law. Um, and the tobacco industry for years, on the other hand, has, has attempted to advance state legislation that would preempt local rule over tobacco issues. In fact, uh, going back to Governor John Waihe, he vetoed a bill uh, after it passed through the legislative process, citing the need for local government or county government to be able to address important health issues that affect their communities. Um, and so uh, we feel that the local government should be able to de determine their own needs for tobacco policies, and the state legislature should support those efforts by establishing a floor, not a ceiling, on what local governments can do to address those needs. Uh, we urge your support of SB 1447 and ask that the legislators return to the home rule on what is one of the most vital public health issues uh, in our communities. Mahalo. Thank you, Mr. Wiseman. Tina Yamaki on Zoom. Aloha and good afternoon. I'm Tina Yamaki with the Retail Merchants of Hawaii, and we are opposed to this bill. Uh, Hawaii businesses are already overregulated, and a measure like this could lead to double taxations and fees and other restrictions. Um, and businesses with locations on neighbor islands, it's going to be hard for them to track all of these laws. The other concern that we have is having different laws on various islands would also be very confusing to not only our Kama Aina, but our visitors who are visiting these other islands. You know, they can do one thing on one island, but not something on another island. And maybe they're not aware of the violation and they could, um, you know, get arrested or fined. We also want to point out that bills like this will not stop um, teenage vaping or anything like that. They'll still be able to get it, whether it's on military bases or on the black market. We all seen what happens, you know, with illegal drugs, you still can get it on the black market. Um, there has to be a better way, but we do not think it's um, having county rule on this issue. Mahalo. Thank you, Tina. Liza Ryan Gill from Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids Action Hawaii. Indicated she would be here, but perhaps is busy elsewhere. Uh, Julian, individual. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Julian Lipshire, testifying as a private citizen in support. Uh, we're not here to argue that cigarette smoking, tobacco use, and nicotine remain the leading cause of death and disease in Hawaii. But despite this, uh, tobacco companies have strategized numerous ways to delay and deflect implementation 
of sound public health practices. They question the science, they quarrel with the implementation, uh, they contribute to uh, candidates running for office, yet their influence has been blunted at the county level where elected officials are closer to the voters and problems are more clearly recognized. So how do you get around this obstacle that thwarts their profit? Preemption, promote the passage of laws where, state, where the state occupies the entire field of regulation, where local voices and county councils are taken out of the picture. If you turn back the clock over a decade ago, the state legislature had not acted on bills to protect citizens from exposure to secondhand smoke. In a short time, all the counties enacted measures uh, and it demonstrated the need and the popularity for state action and a comprehensive state law was subsequently enacted that we all enjoy today. Now the issue is vaping. Again, it's been almost a decade without action. We know the counties will act. The industry knows the counties will act. So as mentioned before in 2018, they were able to attach a preemption clause to a needed kidney dialysis bill, which passed uh, despite strong opposition to this provision and was added late in the session. Repealing preemption would restore local control, allow voices, local voices to be more readily heard and county councils to be able to take actions to protect the public's health when measures at the state level have stalled. So I urge you to consider and pass this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good to see you. You as well. Thank you, Julian. Yale Osowski, I believe they're going to join us via Zoom. Yes. Yes. All right, um, members of the committee, chairs, uh, my name is Yael Osowski. I'm deputy director at the Consumer Choice Center. Uh, there are many great things I'd, I'd love to tell you all about uh, Hawaii upon all the, my visits and my family coming there, but we have a constitutional issue uh, before us and uh, very happy that you have allowed me to speak. Um, you're not being asked today to consider the lawfulness of any nicotine alternative products. You're being asked really how they will be regulated. Should it be regulated by this body, by your colleagues, or by the councils and the mayors? throughout Hawaii's five counties. Can Kauai or Maui County ban these products on their own or should they continue being exempted from doing so? So I, I speak to you not as a constitutional practitioner or a health rights campaigner, uh, but only as a consumer advocate who has been helping protect the rights of adults to choose safer and less harmful products. At present, Hawaii residents have and they benefit from a safe, legal, and competitive market in non-tobacco nicotine alternatives. Now we're talking about vaping devices and liquids, we're talking about pouches, gums, uh, we're talking about an entire industry that actually has been created by the market and is supported by consumers to get people off of smoking, people who have become addicted, and that's something that can radically change their lives. Uh, there are other bills that have come before the legislature and in other committees that try to ban or restrict or tax many of these products out of existence. And a lot of traditional tobacco products are still available, still on the shelf and unperturbed. Uh, there are 1,400 Hawaiians who lose their lives every year because of smoking. But we know that with vaping products and nicotine alternatives, they're 95% less harmful. We know that 7% of Hawaii's population actually use vaping products today, and the vast majority of those are actually retirees above 65 years old, according to the Hawaii Journal of Medicine and Public Health. If retirees have their smoking cessation options taken away, this only nudges them either to return back to smoking, to put their health at risk, or to really get them to go back to the unregulated market. Our goal sincerely with whether it be this committee, whether it be another piece of legislation is to try to expand people's choices to quit tobacco and not to limit them. And our fear is that if SB 1447 is adopted, the counties would move quickly to deprive these adults of these safer options. And that would be unaware of any of the severe repercussions or harm that could happen from that. Again, you're not being asked to judge the effectiveness of any of these alternatives. Uh, just to state whether or not the county should have that role. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, Peggy Mertzwalk. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Peggy Mertzwalk with the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Thanks so much for hearing this measure today. 
Um, we're in strong support of Senate Bill 1447, which would give back the ability to counties to regulate the sale of tobacco products. Um, it, through Act 20, 208 in 2018, they lost that ability, thereby um, allowing the tobacco industry to solely focus on defeating legislative efforts at the state level. Instead of dividing their focus, time, and money on, mul on multiple policy efforts at the local level. A county should be able to manage the public health of its community. The state creates a minimum standard, and a county could then enact stricter policies in order to keep their community safe. Restoring the ability of a county to regulate tobacco products at the point of sale is a tool that is part of a comprehensive approach to addressing the rapid increase of youth users. In particular, our neighbor islands have seen quickly escalating levels of young people using electronic smoking devices, also known as e-cigarettes or vapes. According to the CDC's Youth Risk Behavior Surveys, from 2015 to 2019, which is our most current data, there was more than a 5% statewide increase in high school students who reported using ESDs. The 29 rates of reported use by teens who had ever tried electronic smoking devices in Hawaii County were at 56.5% and in Maui County, 58.1%. Those are extremely high when report, um, compared to Honolulu, which was 44.5%. Yet the current HRS does not allow the counties to implement policies which would help to address this unique situation. Historically, the counties have been in the forefront of tobacco policy. In fact, Hawaii Island was the fourth jurisdiction in the nation to enact Tobacco 21 laws. They would be prohibited from doing so today. Um, just real quick, you know, 89% in a poll by ward research of uh, registered voters, 89% of the people polled believe the county should be allowed to enact stricter policies in order to protect their youth. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Peggy. Cynthia Au from the American Cancer Society. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. Um, Cynthia Au from the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, and we stand in strong support of this bill. Um, I just wanted to say that any use of tobacco products are harmful. There are, is no safe smoking product. Um, and there was a study that came out that for every one person that used an electronic smoking device that 88 kids start. So I don't, you know, that's a really big, vast comparison or difference. Um, and I just wanted to add that ACS can recommend repealing the entire section 328J-11.5 or to remove and stricken 328J-11.5 section B on page five line, uh, page five, um, to page six, uh, page six, line two, which then will clearly express that counties can pass local laws that are more stringent than state laws. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in Senate Bill 1447? Members, any questions? Yes, Senator Elifant. Question for Ms. Mirzwa. Hi, thank you for being here and yeah. testifying. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned that some neighbor island counties in comparison to city and county of Honolulu have higher rates. Mm -hmm. In your research, could you, is there any particular reason why that is? Um, there might be theories, but um, I, I actually don't know. Maybe the Department of Health knows why the rates are different. Um, they have been consistently for a long time now. And um, yeah, okay. that, that's why the, that's why Hawaii Island is interested in this. Got it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry I'm jumping in. Um, real quickly, um, are there any other states in which regulations like this are done on a municipal by municipal basis and not done by the state level? Um, in other states, there, yes, to in which, brief. Which ones are there? Um, I would have to look, but what happens in municipalities? They have departments of, in counties rather to have departments of health too. So um, I could get you a list of that. Yeah, if you could, that would be great because it seems to me, especially like a big state having thousands of municipalities that have different regulations for sale and tax. And just to let the record reflect, I've been a strong supporter of anti-vaping and smoking. I've not received a dime from any tobacco companies, but my question is a practical one. So 
just for uh, for instance, in Brookline, Massachusetts, they that town um, stopped selling flavored tobacco products. Mm -hmm. So that is just a town. So that's the municipality. We saw the same thing um, in a few towns in when California. The county were to pass, like the municipality were passed, one were passed mm -hmm. one tax rate and reporting and labeling requirements. Another town were to pass another labeling and reporting requirements and tax rate. And so taxes in the state of Hawaii only go through the state. The counties no, can't. No, no, no. I'm oh. talking about different municipalities. I mean, because under the bill, it gives the counties the ability to be able to pass different regulations, which I would assume including tax rates and everything else. No, no, no not in Hawaii. Tax only happens at the state level. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, thanks for the appreciate it. You're welcome. Right I, um, just really quick. Uh, these are not cessation products. I just, you know, the FDA does have approved cessation products. So, okay. yeah. No, I'm more with yeah. We're looking at the I, yeah. municipality. Uh, any other questions? If not, we're going to take a brief recess prior to taking the vote. Thank you for your patience. We reconvening this committee on public safety, intergovernmental, and military affairs for decision making on Senate Bill 151 relating to law enforcement. We're going to take the Attorney General's um, um, suggested amendments with regard to uh, defining proceedings, also take their uh, amendments regarding the uh, definition for use of force. As well as we're going to take the Kauai Police Department's suggested amendments about clearly defining the difference between a division head and from a department head. So those three recommendations. Members, any discussion? If not, Senator Elefante, I vote yes. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 151 with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Fukunaga is excused. Senator McKelvey? Yes. Senator Awa? No. Mr. Chair, the measure passes Thank with you. amendments. Thank you. On Senate Bill 685 relating to firearms, um, considering this bill would actually diminish the uh, penalties for brandishing a, uh, a weapon that is actually more lenient than terroristic threatening charges, the committee has decided to defer this measure. The next uh, firearms bill is 882. Uh, this is the one that uh, ramps up training requirements and tasks the police department with all kinds of inquiries, interviews, uh, which are cumbersome and really don't see that this is necessary. So the committee will defer this measure. The last measure on this agenda is Senate Bill 1447 relating to tobacco products. I think we all recognize uh, the need to, uh, when appropriate, uh, curb the use of tobacco products and would like to pass this measure out as is. Members, any discussion? Yes. Um, just a brief comment. Thank you, Chair, for your leadership on this. I uh, appreciate those all stakeholders that have come to testify on this, and I'm glad to see that this measure will be uh, your recommendation and in support. Thank you. Yes. Great bill, Senator Infante. <laughs> um, you signed on too. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's your baby. Um, any other discussion? Yes, I do. No, I, I completely, you know, agree with the goals of this bill, big time. You know, I'm, my record's been pretty good, unclear on the fact that, you know, vaping and smoking are terrible habits. Uh, I've seen so many vape pens now collected at our schools, like bags and bags from our teachers and such. Um, I was going to go with reservations because I am worried about mechanical realities of having it different from the counties. However, I don't know if you could indulge me on perhaps having the next committee further explore that, but in the meantime, to support you and your efforts and our counties, I'm going to withhold a reservation vote and go straight up, but I would like my concerns noted for the record because the mechanics of the different counties have different types of ordinances. So. Okay. Thank you, Senator Joe. Any further discussion? If not, Senator Lefonte, I vote yes. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to report S. B1447 as is of the four members present. Any objections? Any reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, the measure passes as is. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>
Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm ready. IT, we have to take a vote on one bill. I know, you're live, Chair. Uh, you're, you're already live, Chair. Sure. You're already live. Yeah, so, so you're already oh, you're already live? Yeah. No, no, no. I didn't hear what she's saying. Uh, thank you for your patience. We're going to go back to our 3 o'clock agenda. This was a hearing that we had previously with the Committee on Health and Human Services. At that time, we didn't have quorum, but we are lucky to have quorum now. So I'd like to go and take a vote on Senate Bill 310 relating to children and family of incarcerated individuals. Um, the recommendation is to pass this measure as is. Members, any discussion? If not, Senator Elefanti, I vote yes. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 310 as is. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Fukunaga's excuse. Senator McKelvey. Yes. Senator Awa. Aye. Mr. Chair, the measure passes as is. Thank you. We are adjourned for this year. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we'd like to convene the Committee on Public Safety, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs and our good friends from the Committee on Labor and Technology. It is uh, somehow four o'clock again on this Friday, February 10th in room 225. We have three measures on this agenda. The first being Senate Bill 1330. And on our testifiers list, we have James Barrows from Haima. Good Chair. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Uh, Haima submitted written testimony in support of 1330. Um, this bill would give us some flexibility in hiring at the supervisory level in this new category of emergency managers and specialists. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Just FYI, we have uh, three bills to get to before 4.30, so I'm asking people if they could keep their testimony short and definitely under a minute. Uh, next on our agenda, uh, excuse me, on our testifiers, this is Kenneth Hara from Department of Defense. Is um, anyone from DOD on Zoom? Not present, Chair. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 1330? Members, any question for Mr. Barrows? No? Okay, we're going to move on to the next measure. That is Senate Bill 1572. We have on our testifiers this. Uh, Brenda Hashimoto from the Department uh, Attorney General's Office. Good afternoon, Senator. Um, actually, I'm here from the Office of Collective <coughs> Action. Uh, we provided written testimony, which um, I'll just highlight briefly. Bargain Unit 10, we believe, is um, it, it's not necessary to separate out the EMS workers from Unit 10. Um, we already have uh, language in place in the current contracts, which are specific to EMS, which allows them to negotiate provisions that they feel are unique to their working conditions. So we believe that this uh, creating a new bargain unit is unnecessary. Louis Salaveria from Budget and Finance has submitted test uh, commentary. Kamakana. Chairs, Vice Chair, Kamakana Kamala, Government Affairs Manager. Uh, United Public Workers testifying on behalf of State Director Connie Werner. You have a written testimony in strong support, and we're actually going to, I'm going to defer our um, verbal, verbal comments to uh, our Chief Steward, Kenneth Furia, who will be testifying later. Mahalo. Thank you, Kamakana. Shannon Francisco Riley <coughs> indicated she would be here and has submitted testimony in support. Sonia Austin? Yes. 
Thank you for allowing me to come. And I know your time is very valuable. We didn't want to have 100 people come and say the same thing. Um, I've been working for EMS for 23 years now, boots on the ground, supervisor. And we really need our own bargaining unit, just like all of the other uh, nine people that answer 911, police, fire, ocean safety, and us also. Um, we do get outvoted a lot of times because our numbers are smaller. So, um, you know, it's hard for us to get our needs met. So I'm in support of Bill 1572. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and your service. Thank you. Is Chair. We have Kenneth Faria. Aloha, Chairs. Moriwaki, Chair Wakai. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. I stand upon my written testimony now as a 20 year veteran um, in EMS, now functioning as a district chief. Um, I have learned that when I encounter an employee who may have uh, made an error or was experiencing subpar par performance, I don't come with pointing the finger directly at that individual. Rather, I look at the system and see if the system is failing the employee. Now, as a the chief steward for UPW with EMS, I've been doing this part for roughly 10 to 12 years. I can confidently say that through experience, the system is filling EMS, the bargaining system. Now staffing is at a critical error in Honolulu EMS. And as I go through these things, it's, it's, it's been, um, it is a nationwide issue, not only in Honolulu EMS, but across the nation with paramedics. Uh, that's some numbers here I wanted to read for you folks, and it has directly to do with attrition in Honolulu EMS. Now, overall, from 2020 to today, as we speak, we have hired 124 employees, and we have lost 117. Last year in particular, in 2022, we, we hired 46, and we lost 55. As of today, in 2023, we, we hired three, and we lost three. Now, it's anticipated that there's a large amount of um, paramedics and EMTs are going to leave the system. There's a lot of things to fix Honolulu EMS. This would be one of the big pieces of the pie to really address these issues. Thank you very much. And I'll stay here for any questions. Okay, we're going to take questions at the end. Thank you. <clears throat> um, is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 1572? Members, any questions of those who are here and via Zoom? If not, I'm going to no. Yeah, sure. Just uh, um, Senator Pavel. Um, AGs. There's no eight. I mean, no. Oh, I'm sorry. There's <coughs> more, 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 more. bargaining. Yeah, bargaining person. Sorry. Can I please hop this? I code. We're getting confused around here. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. I, I understand you saying um, that um, <clears throat> it, it's not needed, but um, did they, did anybody go out there and talk to the the, the men and the people in the trenches to find out um, why um, they think this is needed? I have not, no. I, I don't know specifically what their arguments are. I, I can just tell you from a collective bargaining perspective that there there is a whole section dedicated to EMS. So if they have specific concerns or issues that they want to address through collective bargaining, there is already a mechanism in place to address those and put them into the unit 10 agreement, as well as they have their own salary schedule, which is independent from the healthcare workers, as well as from um, the ACOs, the adult corrections officers. So we already address compensation separately for each of those different groups. So our position is that uh, a separate bargaining unit is, is not needed. So, so you think the, the, the way it is now is it, it is being effective? Because it seems like um, it's not being effective. That's the reason why they're asking for the own bargaining unit. Because if it was successful and being effective that they could use it and as easy as you're seeing it, um, then they would have been um, happy and not um, upset. So I just wanted to know if um, it was that easy of using them. Um, did anybody try to go out there and talk to the EMS guys, how to go through the process and use it? What you say you have or how you have it uh, listed or you just, um, like I know you didn't, you said you didn't go see them. So um, I just wanted to know if, you know, what kind of data you have besides the saying that it's not needed because they have all these provisions because um, I just, yeah, it's, it's really it's really hard to try to make you understand if um, you didn't get you to talk to any of them. So when this bill was being um, introduced or um, coming up, um, 
you, you didn't think to talk to any of these guys um, that was uh, feeling this way um, about the bargaining unit? I have not, but um, from the state's perspective, we also allow them to um, engage in negotiations with the city. They can enter into, into memorandum of agreement separately on all of those issues. So the city would take the lead in having those discussions. I don't know personally what their specific concerns are, but we're certainly open to um, discussing them with them and see if we, if we can reach an agreement outside of the master contract, which is currently um, settled. Okay, thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, members, we are past deadline, so if you could keep our questions to minimum and those who are testifying, uh, please speak uh, in under a minute. I'm going to pass this over to my co-chair, uh, Senator Mario Wahoo. Thank you, Chair. Um, from the um, Labor and Technology Committee, we have uh, Senator Lee here and also Senator Keith Arvon. We are going to go into uh, Senate Bill 15, 72 related to elected bargaining. Uh, oh, so, sorry, 16, sorry, 1614, um, which is collective bargaining for um, the uh, Department of Public Safety's Correction Division. Um, and it's to create a separate bargaining unit for the adult corrections officers uh, for the Department of Public Safety. First up, we have um, the Department of Public Safety. Anyone from uh, uh, representing the Department of Public Safety here? Okay, uh, we have opposition from the department. We um, have next up the Director of Budget and Finance, Louis Salveria. Anyone here or on Zoom? Okay, we have comments um, from the Director. And Rena Hashimoto from the Department of Human Resources Development. Thank you. Um, my comments would be the same. We have the same concerns. Obviously, this is currently part of the same bargaining unit. So separating them out, we believe this is, again, not necessary. In, in this case, the adult corrections officers make up the vast majority of the members of this bargaining unit 10. So I, I feel like they're they're well represented and their their concerns are being heard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so do we have anyone else? Um, I have UPW. Come, come. Chairs, Vice Chairs, uh, Kamal Khan, Kamal Law, again, Government Affairs Manager for United Public Workers, testifying on behalf of State Director Colony Warner. You have a written testimony and strong support. I'm going to actually turn it over to my colleague, um, Mr. Tulikafai, to actually provide our, our oral uh, remarks. Good afternoon, Chairs Moriwaki, Wakai, Vice Chairs uh, Lee and El Fante, uh, members of the committee, Tulikafai, um, Government Affairs Specialist for the EPW. I'm actually here as a corrections officer. Luckily for me, Section 6 of our contract allows for me to step away from my job as a corrections officer to um, work with the union to um, help see how I can best assist our members. Um, I've been the direct union representative for our, <clears throat> our corrections officers for the last year. And I have six, over six years of experience as ACO. And you've received UPW's written testimony and strong support. Um, I have the utmost respect. I had anticipated to be here with a bunch of other folks. Unfortunately, a lot of them are in 16 to 24 hours um, work shifts right now. So we're unable to join me today, which is very unfortunate. Um, but being in a new bargaining unit could potentially provide these seals with the opportunity to better negotiate future contracts, um, working conditions. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Um, we have them working 16, 24, 32, 40, 48 hours. Um, and you know, issues that are happening and so staff shortages. And so those are a lot of things that we think as a separate bargaining unit could be addressed. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I work with great people, with brave men and women in the state um, that represent every district that you represent. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Could you stay, I, I do have questions here. I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Um, so we heard from the HRD director that um, the ACOs are a big part of bargaining unit 10. So how many how many employees or how many um, ACOs are, are in the bargaining unit? You know? So um, active members of UPW, not necessarily the all of the ACOs. ACOs. We're talking about um, about just under fifteen hundred. Oh, okay. So who so statewide? Okay. Thank you. All right. 
Um, so I have individual um, um, testifiers in written testimony, Raymond Ma'e in support. I have Paul Kyles in support. Uh, Daryl Wilcox in support. Ashley Kamela Nela in support. Anyone else to testify on Zoom or in person? If not, <coughs> uh, moving it along. Do you want to break or do you want to just decide? Yeah, you can decide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, members, any questions? Yeah, I can have uh, two, uh, two, two leads. Just keep in mind where we only got five minutes. So we're always talking about the overtime and uh, stuff happening over there. Everybody having a problem in retaining and retention. And we've been seeing a lot of bills um, from a lot of the departments, uh, from the governor, about how we can retain uh, workers and uh, how qualified. Do you think about having you guys own bargaining, bargaining unit uh, would help in recruiting and retention? We believe so. We believe that um, being able to address direct needs for um, corrections officers could help um, better position us to, um, you know, address things that are very important to corrections officers um, in the present and for the future, and then make it more attractive like it used to be. I come from a family of corrections officer, and so we, it was a job that we've all wanted, and so, you know, we want to get to that point where it used to be where it was a profession that people wanted to join, because it's an honorable profession that, um, that it is, corrections officers. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Senator Fabella. We're going to move straight into taking the vote on these three measures. On Senate Bill SB 1330, uh, the chairs have conferred and we would like to defer this measure. On Senate Bill 1572, relating to collective bargaining, the chairs have conferred. We'd like to move this bill out as is, but in the committee report, uh, note the concerns that were expressed by budget and finance as well as uh, uh, Deher. Um, members, any discussion? And we're going to defect the date and make it effective in uh, January 1st, 2050. Members, so any discussion? If not, Senator Elefante, I vote yes. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass out SB 1572 with amendments. Uh, Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Fukunaga is excused. Senator McKelvey. Yes. Senator Awa. Aye. Mr. Chair, the measure passes. Uh, same same recommendation. Uh, yes, SB 1330. Oh, we deferred 13. Oh, I'm sorry. 1572. 1572. Thank you. Voting on SB 1572. Recommendation is to pass with amendments. Noting. Are all, all, all members present? Are there any reservations or no's? If not, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Uh, okay, for um, Labor Committee, uh, Senate Bill 1614 relating to collective bargaining uh, regarding the uh, bargaining unit, separating out bargaining unit for adult corrections officers. Uh, the Chair votes to um, um, uh, um, send it out unamended with the defective date, but in the uh, uh, committee report to note that the department does have concerns in the polls and also the concerns of HRD and uh, budget and finance. With that, um, with the defective effective date, Chair votes aye. Voting on SB 1614, recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting all members present. Are there any reservations or no's? If not, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. For the Committee on Public Safety, Intergovernmental, and Military Affairs, same recommendation. Any discussion? If not, Senator Lefonte, I vote yes. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 1614 with amendments of the four members present from the Committee on Public Safety, and Intergovernmental, and Military Affairs. Any objections? Any reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, the measure passes with amendments. Great, thank you. We're adjourned.